Several years ago, I was with a bunch of students, and we were at a summer camp in southern Colorado, and it was in a, a small or outside of a small town called Westcliff, Colorado, and there was this amazing camp there, and at the very like back side of the acres that the camp owned, there was this trail that led up to a 13,000-foot peak, and it was called Horn Peak, and so this was a seven-mile out-and-back trail that the camp actually encouraged a lot of the students, the leaders, the, the youth pastors, anyone who was at the camp, they encouraged us to take one of the days during camp and plan a hike with the students to do this. And so uh, we were really excited about the idea when we went and visited the camp and checked things out. So we wanted to make sure that was on our list of things to do while we were at the summer camp. So we started announcing it during our morning meetings. We announced it during lunch, trying to get kids to sign up for this hike, the seven mile hike that we were gonna do to Horn Peak at this camp. And so, uh, you know, the, the plan was you wake up, you eat a really, really quick breakfast on your way to the trailhead, you pack a lunch that we were gonna eat at the summit, and then we we're gonna have just enough time to walk back into camp, have a, about an hour of free time before dinner with the rest of the campers who chose not to go. So we were excited, tons of students like wanted to do this. They, they put their names on the list, and then the morning of came, and we, you know, saw the number kind of get cut in half because a lot of kids just slept in. Uh, we had to be there before the sun came up. And at summer camp, sometimes kids don't realize that uh, that hour exists. And so we made sure that the kids had their lunches packed. We made sure that they had enough water. And we began this journey. We began this hike. And so I'm going to be showing some pictures on the back screen of just what some of the, the parts of the hike look like. And so it started off in a very, like, wooded area. So we were seeing a lot of trees, seeing a lot of uh, nature, a lot of different things that you would typically see in a forest, right? So we're uh, walking through, seeing all this stuff. It's pretty easy, nothing too complicated at this point, right? Pretty wide trail, and uh, we continued through uh, this part of, of the hike. And then eventually, uh, they're going to advance a couple slides. And, and eventually, we got to uh, the tree line where, like, that spot where the trees are kind of thinning out and you're getting above that tree line. And at this point, it's, it's you know, we're pretty high in elevation. So students who, you know, weren't necessarily used to the elevation change, they're starting to huff and puff a little bit. They're starting to get a little, you know, labored in their breathing. And uh, the view starts opening up at this point. So you can see beyond the trees, you could see amazing views down into Southern Colorado and you could see for miles. It was really, really awesome. And then we continued to walk and continued to hike. And we got to the point at this hike where you could see the actual summit. You could see the top of where we were going. You could see Horn Peak. And it was at this point that we realized this was a much more steep climb, a much more steep like journey than we anticipated. We were like, okay, it doesn't look like that from down at summer camp. It looks like a hill, right? And so now we're up there and we're like, this is very, very steep, much more steep than we anticipated or, or that we thought. And uh, at this point, it was when a lot of the students were starting to complain. They were starting to be like, you know, like, oh my gosh, my legs hurt so much or my lungs are burning. Or now that we were out in the open outside of the trees, the sun was beating down on us and it was really hot. And so kids were saying things like, you know, I don't, I don't know if I want to do this. I, I really don't know if I want to do this. Uh, some of the other things they were saying was, I think this is a bad idea. And I actually looked down at that kid's feet and he was in flip flops. And in the very beginning of this journey, I looked at the kid and I said, hey, you either need to run back to your cabin and get shoes or you need to not do this thing. And he's like, no, I promise I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And I was like, all right, cool. So we're at this point of the journey where we're like seeing where we could go and seeing where we can get to. And I was like, yeah, this was a bad idea for you. Uh, some of the other things they were saying was, hey, you know, I bet the view isn't that great anyways, right? They were saying, well, you know, where we're at, we could see amazing things and the view looks great. And why don't we just take our selfie and our picture right here and we can tell everyone that we got to the summit and we ate our lunch, but we don't really have to do all the work to get up there. Uh, some of the kids were saying, let's just go back now. Some of the middle schoolers were really dramatic. Those of you who have middle schoolers, you can say amen right now. Uh, they were like, I think I'm gonna die. I've never breathed like so labored before. One of the other kids was like, I wish a bear would just come tear my limbs off and 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 end it all. And I was like, okay, guys, like you're, you're getting a little dramatic, like settle down a little bit. And so this is when I really had to rally the troops. So I was saying things like, okay, guys, like you can do this. We didn't wake up before the sun to just like see the summit and then turn back around when we're like within reach, within grasp of getting there. And so I was like, we can do this. 
come on. But inevitably, some of these students decided they were going to turn around, right? They decided that it was too hard. They decided that they, they did not want to continue. And obviously, in that moment, I was wondering why. Like, why would they wake up and they would, you know, challenge themselves to do this and then be so close and then turn back? And, and I would say that after thinking a lot about it and after we got to the top, um, I realized, like, the reality is originally everyone was bought into this idea of climbing the mountain, right? Like everyone was bought into that idea. When we were announcing it from stage, the kids were just thinking of like the top moment where they were eating their lunch and taking their pictures and making this cool memory and moment with God and their friends. And everyone was bought in at that point. They, they had no objections at that point. And then when things started getting difficult for them, they began to doubt, right? They began to doubt their decision to do this. They began to doubt, why did I wake up so early? Why did I not wear the right shoes? Why did I, you know, not, you know, figure something out, more energy bars or energy drinks to get me through this, this like physically grueling experience. And and so they started to doubt. And for a lot of us, I feel like we could probably think back to a moment like this in our faith, or we might be in that moment in our faith right now where we had this faith and this passion and this trust and this love for God. And we were really bought into our faith, but then things can get a little rough, right? Things can get a little uh, tough for you. And and in all reality, um, your feelings about God then become a response or a reaction to what is happening in your personal life, Right? I mean, for some of you, it might have been the job that you were really, really passionate about, the job that you were really excited about. It was, it was the right pay. It was the right location. It was the right position. It was everything that you wanted, and you prayed, God, please give me that job, and then someone else got the job. And, 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 and that week, or maybe that month, or maybe that season, your feelings towards God turned into a reaction to what happened or what didn't happen in that case. Maybe you prayed for God to give you an an answer to a problem and all you got was silence. And it was in that moment that you responded and and your feelings towards God changed because of what happened and, and the lack of a response that you felt like you got from God. Maybe you prayed for a family member's cancer or terminal illness to, to go away or for them to be healed and the only thing that happened was they got they got worse and and they eventually ended up passing away. And and in that season, which I'm sure was more than a day, more than a week, more than a month, your response to God and your feelings towards God are are that reaction of what did or did not happen, what did God do or did not do. And maybe for some of you, you're single and you've been asking and praying and saying, God, give me a husband, give me a wife, but you still find yourself at home on Friday nights watching Netflix. And you're just like, God, like what's going on? And, And your response becomes this different feeling towards God. And for a lot of us, faith is messy. Faith is, is complicated. It could be frustrating. Um, but I don't believe that it's because we don't have enough answers about God. I, I really don't. I, I think we have God's word and I think we have other tools and resources and other believers. Um, but, but I don't think it's because we don't have enough answers about God. I, I think it's, it's because we hit this wall, we hit this moment and we have to decide, am I going to pursue and press in and keep going, or am I going to go back to my old ways? Am I going to continue in, in this journey that I feel like God has me on, or am I going to go back to these, these old, comfortable, familiar ways? It's just like the camp story with Horn Peak. It's like, you know, we all woke up, we packed our lunches, we were pumped, we're excited, and we're so close to the summit and things are getting hard now. Our lungs are burning. Our, our, our legs are burning. We're, we're, we're getting overheated. We're almost out of water. And, and we have to decide, are we going to continue going and do this together? Or are we going to turn back towards camp? You see, giving your life to Christ is amazing. Uh, getting baptized is amazing. Like uh, attending church services regularly, it's amazing. And if you're doing all of those things, that's great. And that's, that's something that you should be very proud of. Um, But I also feel like I need to be real with you guys in a moment because I did all those things. I I checked all those boxes. I I marked all of those things off. 
I gave my life to Christ. I got baptized. I, I was attending church on Monday nights at a small group, Wednesday nights at the youth group, Sunday mornings with the adults, Sunday night at, at another uh, leadership thing. I mean, I was, I was at the church. I was doing the things. I had been baptized. I, I gave my life to Christ, but I still felt like something was missing. Something was missing when things got tough for me personally. I, I was doing all the right things. I was attending all of the right things. I, 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 I just felt like something was missing. Something wasn't as it should have been. And I realized it wasn't necessarily something that was missing. It was someone that was missing. And, and honestly, it was a group of someone's that was missing. And the key thought for today, if you're taking notes, is this. You might be one community away from changing the course of your destiny. The key thought for today is this. You might be one community away from changing the course of your destiny. You, you might be one group of strong, committed believers, the, the ones who go through the highs and the lows with you, the ones who are praying for you, the ones who are lifting you up, they're encouraging you, they're the ones who have your back in those times of need. You're one community away from changing not just your life, but your, your future family and the future generations of your family. Uh, it's, it's gonna change the ability that you have to have an influence on the world. You might be one community away from changing the course of your destiny. Most of the successful relationships that I see are ones that are built on community, a community of people who are committed to working through things. That, that's, to me, what community really, really means. It's, it's a group of people who are committed to working through things. And as I look back over the last 13 years that Danielle and I have been married, uh, I think the key to us having deep friendships has been our commitment to being in community with like-minded people who share the similar values that we do, who, who have the same goals that we have. And, and I made a short list of things that we've seen, that we've experienced, whether it was uh, we got to do this for a community member or a small group member, or maybe our small group that we were in were, were able to do for us in, in different moments. And, and maybe some of you guys can relate with some of these things, but we've helped families move from one side of town to the other. We've helped families move from like third floor apartments down to first floor apartments. We've, uh, we've retiled floors. We've painted houses. We've given money towards missions trips. We've helped a family in our small group at one point. They had a teenage son and they couldn't afford to get him a car at the time. So our small group rallied together. It wasn't a great car. It was a starter car, right? Um, but we were able to pool our money together and help them get their son his first car. We've paid medical bills. We've helped fund adoptions. We've been there in times of need when, when funeral arrangements were needing to be made and the family literally could not think straight because they were so devastated and shocked by a, a sudden death. We were there to help in those times of need. We've, we've made meals for couples after they've had their, their babies. We've, we've taken vacations with people from group. We've done Thanksgiving dinners with people from group. We've done Christmas parties. You know, we bring cakes to celebrations and we bring tissues when the tissues are needed. And, and the way to summarize this whole thing is that reality is like, we do life together. That, that is what community is, you do life together. And it could be messy. And what we see is a modern day reflection of the New Testament community that you read about in Acts 2.42. It said, these New Testament believers, they devoted themselves. It wasn't a half-hearted thing, it was an all-in. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. In other words, it was a community centered around Christ. It wasn't centered around your son or daughter's sport. It stings a little bit. It wasn't centered around that. It wasn't centered around your neighborhood association. It was the community was centered around Christ. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders, and signs were performed by the apostles all of the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. In other words, you're in our family. And if you're in our family, then you don't go without. We've got your back. If it's, if it's something for a medical bill, if it's, if it's uh, to help your son get a car, if it's to help fund an adoption, if it's to go on a mission trip, if it's to retile your floors, whatever it is, if you're in the family, 
we've got you. You're, you're covered. You're, you're in the community, right? And, th- and that's exactly what we see happening in, in today's churches, right? In verse 46, it says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So once again, I'll say this, you might be one community away from changing your destiny. But I promise you this, you don't just stumble and trip and fall into community. Like, it's just not like you, oh, I forgot to tie my shoes today and I tripped over my shoelace and I fell into an amazing group of people who have my back in any time of need. Like, that doesn't happen. I, I wish it did and I wish for the whole world that it did. Anytime they fell and scuffed their knee, it was like they fell into an amazing community. But you create it with the love of Christ in an intentional way as believers come together. You, you have to be intentional about it. You have to seek it out. You have to find it. You have to give what you want to receive as well. So I wanna give you guys three qualities of, of great Christian communities. And, and these, my points, they're, they're a little out there. So, uh, you know, write, write them down, take, take notes, put it in the margin of your Bible, whatever you have to do. Um, but these are uh, three qualities of great Christian communities. Number one is this, we have refrigerator rights. Number one is we have refrigerator rights, okay? So think about this. Uh, it, it, it's my goal that if, if someone's in one of my community groups, one of my small groups that I've led before, uh, you know, my goal is that they don't even have to knock on our front door. They know it's Sunday night at whatever time and we're probably ready an hour before and we're gonna be there two hours after. But the, the goal is they don't even have to knock on the door. And then certainly when they come in, they know they've got refrigerator rights. Like if, if they are thirsty, if they're hungry, they could go in the pantry, they can get whatever they want out of the fridge, out of the freezer, whatever they need, they have refrigerator rights. They don't have to ask because what's mine is yours. Now think about how weird it would be if I came to your house and, and I didn't know you. Um, first of all, I just walk through your front door and I just kind of you know make myself at home I start looking through your fridge. I grab the bologna. I grab the bread. I plop my butt up on your counter. I start making myself a bologna sandwich. Like, you're probably going to be looking at me like, who is this guy? This is strange. He's eating a, who eats bologna sandwiches anyways, right? You're, you're thinking this is a really strange situation. It's, it's because that we don't have that equity. We don't have that relational tie and that relational bond that would give me refrigerator rights in your home and in, and in your life. And, and so... It's something that I probably shouldn't do without permission. Usually when you have someone over for the first time, you are very formal feeling and you've probably cleaned the house really well and have some good smelling things going on and you invite them to sit in your living room and then maybe you offer them a glass of water or drink, refreshment, or you offer them you know, some kind of food or snack. Uh, you, know, it, you, you build yourself into that. You don't just come in and do that, right? So it, it's, it's about having refrigerator rights. When you're family, you can do that. When you go home for Thanksgiving, you go home for, for the holidays, you go back to mom and dad's house or your sister comes over or you know your, your, your cousins or your nieces and nephews, they come over. Most of the time, family has those refrigerator rights. You know, They just come in and you, you come downstairs and there's someone like fridge doors wide open and they're just, they didn't even get a plate. They're just eating straight out of the fridge, right? Um, they just have those refrigerator rights. In fact, this is what they had, I believe, in Acts 2.44. All of the believers were together and they had everything in common. Uh, We're such family that anything I have is yours. And I would ask you this question, think about it. How many people outside of your life, outside of your family, I'm sorry, uh, have refrigerator rights? Outside of your immediate family, how many people, when they come over, have those refrigerator rights? How many people do you have that community with where, when they come over, they just have, they have those rights to go and get what they need out of your fridge, get what they need out of your pantry. You know, I think uh, Danielle and I were talking and, and I think, you know, as a student pastor over the years, there's been seasons where we've had a lot of people with refrigerator rights and then there's been times where there's not been so many. Uh, she's led a group, I've led a group, we've been in an adult group, we've led another group. And I mean, there's been times where we've probably had like 30 people, 40 people that have refrigerator rights and our fridge is empty sometimes, right? Um, but it wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that way. You know, when I, when I was starting out in ministry, um, we didn't let people in early on. We didn't let people into this like community feel. And, and one of the reasons why is when I was in Bible college, we had this guy who came in and taught. And, and, and 
um, I'll never forget it. He talked about this thing called the pastor's mystique. And, and he talked to those of us who are going to Bible college at the time about this idea and this mentality of, well, you can't be normal. You know, you, you're, you're supposed to lead the people and you're supposed to give them spiritual food and you're supposed to be at a different level than them. So you can't be normal with people. You can't let them in. And so I remember starting out in ministry thinking, oh, well, that's what that guy said. I should probably do that. I should probably be guarded and we shouldn't let people like in and see the real us. But we realized very quickly, especially in student ministry, that just doesn't work, right? It just doesn't come across authentic. And um, so we realized that there's, there's moments where we're gonna be pastor Dan and Danielle, and then there's moments where we're just gonna be Dan and Danielle, and we're gonna uh, open up our house, and we're gonna open up our fridge, and we're gonna open up our pantry, and we're going to take risks. We're gonna love, and we're gonna be loved, we're going to uh, sometimes probably get hurt and we might hurt some other people at some point. We might be disappointed and we might disappoint other people, but the risk of not having community is far greater than the risk of having it. We must have it because it's how God created us. It's, it's to depend on him and to depend on each other. So number one, we have refrigerator rights. Uh, the second thing, if you're taking notes, is this, the, the second quality of great communities is this. We all have flawed feet. We all have flawed feet. Now, some more than others. I like to think that I fall into this semi-flawed category, okay? So uh, Danielle and I were putting our kids to bed the other night, and this actually came up, and I felt very judged and very made fun of in this moment. Um, uh, but reality is um, my, my daughter was saying how long my toes were, and she said, Daddy, you could like play the piano with your toes and you could type 110 words per minute with those toes. And so uh, my daughter thinks that my feet are very socially unacceptable because of that. So when someone knocks on our door, uh, she's like, Daddy, put some socks on. Like you can't show those feet around here. So, uh, so yeah, we all have flawed feet, okay? Um, Romans 15, seven says this, uh, it tells us we are to accept one another, flawed feet and all, accept one another than just as Christ has accepted you. And when we're accepted and we're loved in, in the context of a community, Paul says this, this brings praise to God. And, and while I bragged on our groups that we've been a part of over the 13 years we've been married and in small groups and community groups, um, I didn't really share about the flaws. I shared about all the amazing things that we got to see and got to do and got to be a part of, but the people in those groups were flawed. They had flawed feet. They had their issues. There was marital issues. There were teenagers that were like kind of going off and doing their wild thing in college. There were, there were times when parents didn't get it right in the parenting thing. Like there were a lot of different flaws that we had represented in that group. But the important thing is that we encouraged and loved one another. Uh, we, we helped take marriages that could have failed and we made them strong again. We, we've seen um, other parents make investments in, in Braxton and Taylor, our kids, that were so much more valuable than us saying those things to our kids. And, and so when you're in community, it's once again saying, hey, we're, we're like-minded people who are in community and we're committed to making it work, flawed feet and all. It doesn't matter what flaws you bring to the table or what flaws I bring to the table, we work through it all because we all have flawed feet. In fact, in scripture, uh, you know, there's, there's several times where uh, it's talked about, you know, where someone was a cripple or someone had some type of defect when they're born, people uh, would say, oh, it's because of the sin. It's, it's because of, uh, of the parent's sin that that child was born that way or because of the sin. Um, and there's a story in the Old Testament about a guy named Mephibosheth, okay? Try to say that one a lot. Um, uh, who had an accident and he was lame in his feet. So society rejected him, but the king had mercy on him and he showed him love because of another relationship. In 2 Samuel 9, 13, it says, and Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he was always at the king's table. And it goes on to say he was lame in both feet. So don't miss the part that says that society rejected him. Society shunned him. Society pushed him off to the side but the king accepted him and he always ate at the king's table. And, and, and I don't know about you guys, but the reality is we all have crippled feet. But when we come to the king's table, guess what's covered? Guess what people don't see when you eat and you dine at the king's table? They don't see the feet. So when we as the community, we as the church, when people are coming in, 
whether it's on a Sunday or a Thursday or a small group or anywhere where we are represented, we have to say, you know what? We accept you flawed feet and all because we all have the flaws that we bring to the table. We all come with our flawed feet and we're all able to pull up to the table of the Lord, the King of Kings, and we dine together and, and, and we give each other grace even though we have flawed feet. So number one, we have refrigerator rights. Number two, we all have flawed feet. And the third unusual metaphor today is this. Uh, we fight lions. We fight lions. A great quality of a Christian community is, is that together we fight lions. First Peter 5, 8 tells us to be alert and of sober mind because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. He's looking for someone to devour. Now, I don't want you guys to miss the connection between Satan and lions and the cat family. Those of you who are dog fans right now, you understand what I'm saying. Like, there's just something about Satan and cats that go together. Just a, just a side point, just a side point, okay? Um, but we really do, we really do have a spiritual enemy, okay? Uh, and he wants to devour, he wants to, to steal, he wants to pick you off, he wants to destroy everything that matters to God. And some of you may have forgotten this, but you are a son, you are a daughter of God and you matter to God, and because of that, he wants to steal, and he wants to destroy, and he wants to do whatever he can to hurt you. We have a spiritual enemy who wants to do those things. Now, I wanna show you guys a quick video clip, uh, and this is a, a great picture of, of how I believe we can stand together as Christians, okay? So it's got a little, uh, it's got a water buffalo in it. Uh, it's a shortened version um, so you'll see there's lions crouching down over here because that's what they do. That's what the enemy does. They crouch down. He tries to hide. And at some point, the lions pop out and they're like, okay, that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's the biggest water buffalo I've ever seen. So they're gonna try to go attack it. And then all of a sudden they see the little baby, right? They see the vulnerable one and they try to get it. And I wouldn't show this unless the water buffalo lives. So you can just breathe a sigh of relief. But you know, what's happening here is the lions are attacking this guy. And that's what's gonna happen. Satan, the enemy is going to attack our family. He's gonna try to pick us off. Maybe not you, maybe one of your kids, maybe the vulnerable one in the family. Um, but the lions don't realize that the water buffalo, they stick together. They're a community. And so what you see is these water buffalo are basically saying, hey, you didn't realize that when you messed with the littlest one, the smallest one, we're not gonna give up. We are a family, we're a community. And you start to see the bigger water buffalo protecting the littler ones, right? We outnumber you. And what you'll see over the next couple of seconds is that they run them all off and the little water buffalo lived to eat another day. So my question to you guys is this, don't you think that if a herd or a group of water buffalo can stick together, <laughs> that the church can do that as well. So yeah, there goes the little lions running away, like all scared and stuff, right? Um, so if, if water buffalo can do that, can't we do it as a church too? And, and, and we can fight for each other. We can fight with each other because when the enemy comes, it's not time to roll over. It's time to stand up and fight because here's the deal. Christianity is not a playground. And reality is sometimes when we've been Christians, we've been Christ followers for a long time or uh, a season of time, sometimes it begins to feel like, oh, Christianity is just, it's a playground. I can let my kids go off and play or I can let my family go off and do this or I'm gonna go into my job just like I do every day and I don't have to be on guard. I don't have to worry about the attacks of the enemy because I've been a Christian for five years or 10 years or you know whatever the amount of time you have been. But reality is, this, this Christianity, this, this life that we're living, it, it's a battleground and our enemy comes to attack, but we've got to have each other's backs. You do not want to go down without the support of others. You don't want to fight cancer alone. Like if you're going to go through cancer, if you have family going through cancer, you don't want to go through that alone. I, I, I don't know how people that don't have community work through and fight through someone going through cancer like that without the help of community loving and supporting and caring for them. You don't want to hurt financially alone. You don't want your, your kid, whether they're a teenager, they're in college or they're grown, you don't want that kid wandering off 
alone, like without the support and without the love and without the prayers of community and people at your back. What you want is the body of Christ standing with you, loving you, praying for you, encouraging you, and fighting with you because when you're alone, you're vulnerable. And some of you guys right now, you're vulnerable. And you're one community away from changing the course of your destiny. And when you have it, it's so rich and it's so satisfying and it's so meaningful. And those of you in the room who have had it or have it, you know how much it means to you. And if you're someone in the room today who, you know, you've, you've given your life to Christ, you've gotten baptized, you attend church regularly, congratulations, I'm really excited for you, but I would say you're missing out on one of the most important parts of our Christian faith, and that is being in community, being in life with other people, which sometimes gets messy. Sometimes we have situations like we saw on the screen, but we come together and we fight lions So number one was we have refrigerator rights. Number two is we have flawed feet. And number three, we fight lions. And uh, I'm gonna ask Aaron and the the band to come up. Um, We're going to close, and and the song that we're closing with, some of the lyrics in the song um, say, this is how I fight my battles. Uh, You know, it says, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And and I don't think that there's probably a a more perfect or... or, um, uh, fitting song that, that we could sing together as a church right now after really talking about what it means to be in community. And, and for some of you, you might feel surrounded by your problems right now. You might feel surrounded by issues right now. But I would just say that it, just like this song says, it may look like I'm surrounded, but, but God, I'm surrounded by you. I'm surrounded by your love. I'm surrounded, hopefully, by a community of people who are gonna help me fight my battles. So I want you guys to go ahead and close your eyes and and bow your heads uh, before we uh, go into this final song and then dismiss. And and, uh, I just want to ask you, I I just want you to take this inventory of your head of like, do, do I have community? Do I have people who have my back? Do I have people who uh, really understand where I am, what I need? And, and, and when it does happen, when that issue does arise and we hit that wall, are we going to continue pursuing what God has called us to or are we going to turn back? So if you're in the room today and you say, you know what, Dan, I, I resonate. I, I understand what you're saying. And I would admit, like I, I've, I've been coming to church and I've been a part of the church, but I think that maybe I've been missing out on one of the most important aspects of what God wants us to have. And that is that biblical Christian community that we read about in Acts 2. If that's you, um, I would love you to just raise your hand so I can pray for you today. I could just pray for our church that if you say I'm missing that in my walk with God, uh, would you just slip up your hand and put it right back down if that's you? All right, awesome. Here's what I wanna do today. I wanna pray for you guys and, and just pray that God would continue to knit our church together and continue to bring our church into this community where we can have these things together. Let's pray. God, we come before you. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for your word. And we thank you that uh, the, the early church gave us this example of what it looks like to sell and give so that those who were in need around us had what they needed. And so God, help us to mirror that. Help us to look into the Bible, look into your word, and wanna see that reflected in our lives, that we can do what it takes to love and care and stand up and fight for those who are in need in our community. God, be with us. It's your name we pray, amen. Thank you for listening to The Brook Podcast. We are real people finding real hope in the real world. Learn more at thebrookchurch.net.